Hello, and welcome to the first of a three-part series on the impact of parental incarceration on child welfare. My name is Ed Morales, and I'll be narrating this presentation. This presentation was developed with the guidance of Dr. Rebecca J. Schlafer from the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Minnesota. As we mentioned, this is a three-part series. Today we'll be covering some basic information about prisons, including emerging trends and why this information is relevant to child welfare workers. In Module 2, we'll cover parental incarceration's impact on child development and mental health, and in Module 3, we'll discuss visitation, what it looks like, how it differs across facilities, and how it impacts the family system. If you're watching this module for CEUs, please know that there is a test that covers all three modules, so be sure to take the test after you complete the series. To start, we'll explore the different types of correctional facilities. There are three different types of correctional facilities that we're interested in. County jails, state prisons, and federal prisons. Each of these facilities are governed by different bodies, house inmates convicted of different crimes, and have their own rules and regulations. First, let's talk about county jails. County jails are run by local sheriff's departments and house individuals awaiting trial or sentencing, or inmates sentenced to a term of less than one year for misdemeanors. There are 92 correctional facilities in Minnesota, and if you're an astute student of geography, you may have noticed that there are more county facilities than there are counties. That's because in more populous counties, there are often multiple facilities. For example, in Hennepin County, there is an adult corrections facility, often known as the workhouse, an adult detention facility, and a juvenile detention center. While county jails typically house inmates convicted of misdemeanors, due to overcrowding in state facilities, county jails will also often house state prisoners in addition to their regular population. The second type of facilities are state prisons. State prisons are run by the State Department of Corrections and house inmates convicted of breaking state laws. State laws typically cover crimes like gun charges, drug charges, theft, murder, or a number of other types of offenses. State prisons generally house inmates sentenced to anything more than one year plus one day to life. This is a map showing the state prisons in Minnesota. Take a look at the geographical distribution of the facilities. You can see that there are a large number of facilities in the southern part of the state, but only one, MCF Togo, in the northern part of the state. We'll talk more about this in Module 3, but geographical distance plays a major role in whether or not families are able to visit inmates frequently or at all. Imagine living in International Falls, in the northernmost reaches of the state, and trying to visit a family member incarcerated MCF Shakopee. Imagine trying to visit in the middle of winter, when roads are treacherous and drive times are even longer. We should note here that the state doesn't take into account where an inmate's family may live when imposing sentencing. An inmate may or may not be housed close to their family. Again, we'll talk more about this in Module 3. What we can say about where inmates are housed is that all women are incarcerated at MCF Shakopee. All men start their sentences at St. Cloud and then are classified and transferred to another state facility from there. The State Department of Corrections makes available a statewide count of prisoners on a periodic basis. The most recent numbers from the mid-year 2013 census indicate that there were 9,090 men incarcerated in a state facility and 682 women incarcerated at MCF Shakopee. If you're curious about up-to-date statistics, individual facilities maintain a daily population list. These lists can be reviewed by the public often on the facility's website. If you would like more information about these counts, you can find the facility's website and review the numbers online. Finally, let's talk about federal prisons. Federal prisons are operated by the Federal Bureau of Prisons and house inmates convicted of federal crimes. Federal crimes include tax evasion, bank robbery, interstate drug trafficking, acts of terrorism, and many other crimes. The red dots on this map represent federal facilities. There are four federal facilities in the state of Minnesota. The acronyms refer to the type of facility. An FPC is a federal prison camp, an FCI is a federal corrections institution, and an FMC is a federal medical center. In mid-year 2013, there were 812 offenders incarcerated at FPC Duluth, about 1,400 at FCI Sandstone, 981 at FMC Rochester, and 981 at FCI Wasika. While we're here, let's note again the geography of the facilities. As was the case with state prisons, federal prisons are often widely scattered, and, much like with county jails, little provision is made for housing an offender close to family. So while there are four federal facilities in the state of Minnesota, there is no assurance of any kind that a Minnesota offender will be housed in a Minnesota facility. 
again, this has implications for visitation, which we'll discuss at length in Module 3. The final point to note is that federal inmates will often move from facility to facility. So even if a Minnesota offender is housed in a federal facility in or near Minnesota, there's a reasonable chance that he or she will be moved at some point during their incarceration. These decisions are made for security purposes, for inmates who are classified in a particular way, or because population demands necessitate shifting inmates around. We've talked about the different types of facilities, now let's talk about who's inside these facilities. First, let's cover race. You are likely aware that there are racial disparities in the prison population. In Minnesota, a little over half of the inmate population is white, while about a third is African American. American Indians make up 9% of the total population, while 3% of the population is classified as Asian. While 54% of the state inmates are white, 86% of the state population is white. While about a third of the state inmate population is black, just 5.5% of the state population is black. We see similar disparities in level of incarceration among American Indians. American Indians make up 9% of the state prison population, but just 1.3% of the statewide population. Finally, 4.4% of the statewide population is listed as Asian, compared to 3% of the state prison population. Education is an important predictor of adult incarceration. In Minnesota, 83% of the inmate population has earned a high school diploma or less, while 29% of the state prison population has not yet earned a high school diploma or GED. We talked about racial disparities in the last slide, and here it's important to note the education disparities in our state prison system. While 29% of the state prison population has earned a high school diploma or less, just 9% of the population at large has earned less than a high school diploma or GED. And on a related note, while incarcerated, inmates without a high school diploma or GED are expected to work towards attaining their GED credential. So we've covered some basic details about incarceration, both nationally and here in Minnesota. In this section, we'll make the case for why child welfare workers have an investment in understanding parental incarceration. You can see that the number of parents in prison nationwide has climbed significantly since 1991. Not surprisingly, the number of minor children with an incarcerated parent has also climbed dramatically since 1991, increasing over 80%. On this slide, we've combined both fathers and mothers into one line, but it's vital to note that the number of incarcerated mothers has also climbed dramatically since 1991. In fact, between 1991 and 2007, there was a 122% increase in the number of incarcerated mothers nationwide. Finally, please note that these statistics are from 2007, and you may have seen more recent reports that cite higher numbers. So let's take a closer look at the percent of all children with a parent in prison or jail. According to the Pew Charitable Trust, as of 2008, one in nine black children had an incarcerated parent. On this chart, you can see the meteoric rise of the number of children with an incarcerated parent. Between 1980 and 2008, the percentage of children with a parent in jail or prison climbed from 2.6% to 11.4% for black children, for Hispanic children, the percentage grew from 1.3% in 1980 to a peak of 3.7% in 2000, and then a small decline to 3.5% in 2008. The percentage of white children with an incarcerated parent has climbed from 0.4% in 1980 to 1.8% 1 in 2008. Remember that these are national numbers. Minnesota, of course, has a much larger American Indian population than the national average, and so while American Indian parents don't necessarily appear on graphs about the population nationwide, a similar chart for Minnesota would reflect a large number of American Indian children with incarcerated parents. So just to explain this graphic, each slice of the pie represents an age group. Red represents 1 to 4 year olds, green represents 5 to 9 year olds, purple represents 10 to 14 year olds, and so on. You can see that just over half of the children with an incarcerated parent are nine years old or younger. So if we consider this from a developmental perspective, think about the cognitive abilities of children under the age of 10. Compared with older children, younger children often cannot understand the basic facts about their parents' incarceration. They have fewer capacities to process a loss and they lack language and cognitive capacity to express their preferences about placement or visitation. In the next slides, we'll talk more about environmental risk factors, which of course may have a greater or lesser impact on a child's outcome depending on their age at the time of the parent's incarceration and release. 
So let's highlight some contextual risk factors. It's important that we understand where the child is in the ecosystem and also understand the additional risk factors that may be present before, during, and after an incarceration. Incarcerated parents are more likely to have each of the following risk factors present in their lives, and each of these risk factors on their own are associated with poor outcomes. Incarcerated parents are more likely to live in poverty, to have attained a lower level of education, to experience housing instability, including homelessness and high mobility, to experience problems with employment, consider the effect that a felony conviction may have on a person's employability, and may experience greater physical, mental, and chemical health challenges. Finally, there are racial disparities in each of these risk factors. Incarcerated parents are more likely to have each of these risk factors, and incarcerated parents of color are more likely than their white counterparts to exhibit these factors. The takeaway here is that these risk factors are often present in the lives of incarcerated families even before incarceration becomes an issue, and each risk factor is linked with a negative outcome. Parental incarceration, however, acts as a sort of magnifying glass, intensifying the effects of each individual risk factor, which then impacts the child's outcome. In addition to these broader environmental risks, we also think of incarceration-specific risks that children and families may experience before, during, and after incarceration. For example, before a parent is incarcerated, the child may have witnessed some aspect of their parent's involvement with the criminal justice system. Indeed, one recent study found that 36% of incarcerated parents reported that their child witnessed their criminal activity, arrests, or sentencing. This study also found that children's exposure to these experiences was linked to caregivers and children's self-reported maladjustment, such as behavior problems and difficulty with emotional regulation. Remember, too, the earlier slide depicting the ages of the children with one or more incarcerated parents, and consider again the impact of witnessing criminal behavior or an arrest on a child under the age of nine. During the parent's incarceration, a child may be exposed to additional risks. When the parent is incarcerated, the child is, of course, physically separated from their parent. Several scholars have examined this separation and its effects on children's attachment, security, and emotional adjustment. Previous research has also examined how contact, or lack of contact, during incarceration can help or hinder the relationship between the parent and the child. In Dr. Schlafer's work, she found that children who had less contact with their incarcerated parents had more feelings of isolation. If the incarcerated parent was the child's primary caregiver, then the parent's incarceration results in a change to the child's caregiving situation. So, for instance, when mom goes to prison, grandma might now be providing care. This could result in changes in the child's living environment. Children could be separated from siblings, and they may have to change schools. Forthcoming research by Daniel Dallaire and her colleagues demonstrate that these incarceration-specific risks, sort of the domino effect of parental incarceration, if you will, significantly predict children's internalizing and externalizing behavior problems, even after other general environmental risks, such as household size and parent education, are accounted for. It's also important to consider the economic impact of a parent's incarceration. The Bureau of Justice Statistics reported that about half of incarcerated parents were the primary provider of financial support for the child in the month preceding their incarceration. And even after a parent is released from prison, we know that many families still experience challenges. Returning parents often experience considerable difficulty securing housing and employment, which could impact the parent's ability to contribute to the family's resources. If the parent lives with the child upon release, this could again result in changes in where the child lives or goes to school. And even if the parent's return to the household is a desired outcome, this can still result in stress for the family, particularly as the family renegotiates roles and responsibilities. Now we have some homework for you. The Annie E. Casey Foundation has published an excellent guide to parental incarceration for child welfare workers called When a Parent is Incarcerated, a Primer for Social Workers. This document was published in 2011 and contains a wealth of information pertinent to the interests of child welfare workers. Some of the information we presented in this module will be found in the primer, but at greater depth. The primer covers everything from child disposition during an arrest to special cases involving immigration concerns. This document is an excellent complement to the information we'll present in this series, and we invite you to spend some time reading through. You can download the PDF right from the Cashew module website, or you can also find it by searching for any EKC social work primer. Be sure to take a look as information contained in the primer will appear on the final test. 
So we've reached the end of Module 1. We've covered some basic information about the types of correctional facilities in Minnesota, who's housed in those facilities, and why understanding parental incarceration is relevant to child welfare workers. In Module 2, we'll delve more deeply into some of these issues and explore parental incarceration's impact on child development and socio-emotional health.